Good morning and welcome to the Invasive Muscle Collaborative webinar series. I'm excited to introduce our presenters. We have Rich Miller and Krista Gantz from Portland State University and uh, Dr. Alexander Katiev with SUNY Buffalo State. And they're gonna be sharing their work regarding how invasive muscles impact and are impacted by North American ecosystems. My name is Sam Tank and I'm joined by my colleague, James Polidori with the Great Lakes Commission. And on behalf of the Invasive Muscle Collaborative, we wanna thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. Before I turn over the presentations to our presenters, I do wanna provide some background on the Invasive Muscle Collaborative for those of you who might be unfamiliar. The collaborative was convened in 2015 to identify opportunities to advance scientifically sound technology for the management and control of invasive dry seated muscles in order to produce measurable ecological and economic benefits. The Invasive Muscle Collaborative did publish a strategy to advance the management of zebra and quagga muscles in 2018 in an effort to reduce invasive muscles and their negative impacts. So to make progress on these goals, the collaborative established four work groups. We have the research work group, dry scene and toxicity testing work group, coastal site priorities, and most recently, the planning and implementation work group. I wanna briefly talk about some of the outcomes of each of these work groups. I'll start off with the research work group, which is charged with coordinating existing research and developing targeted research plans and projects that address Great Lakes um, management priorities. <clears throat> this collaborative is not a Great Lakes collaborative, like some of our other invasive species collaborative, it is um, throughout North America as well. And so we do, look at um, priorities beyond the Great Lakes. Uh, almost exactly a year ago, the work group released a mapping tool to help protect the Great Lakes Basin from the impacts of invasive mussels. And this, what you can see on the slide right now, is the Dreisena Project Coordination Mapper. And this allows researchers and managers to share their work and collaborate with others um, for the advancement and protection of waterways from invasive mussels in the Great Lakes and beyond. The mapper features 125 past and current projects from across North America and more and more being added um, all the time. The research work group is currently soliciting additional research and applied control projects. So whether you have um, a strictly research or an applied control project, we'd really like you to consider submitting them. It can be done directly through the mapper. Additionally, project updates are encouraged for those existing projects that have made progress since you've originally submitted um, the description. You can view the mapper and submit projects by following the bit.ly URL that's up on the screen. Next, I want to talk about some of the recent accomplishments of the Dreisena Toxicity Testing Work Group. This work group was charged with reviewing how toxicity testing of potential control methods on muscles has been conducted across various laboratories, research the strengths and strengths and weaknesses of uh, different approaches and methods and identify and make recommendations to where those methods could be further refined and standardized so that we can um, develop guidance for use by researchers doing Dreisenid toxicity testing. The studies reviewed for this work have been compiled into a table that's uh, searchable and available on the Invasive Muscle Collaborative website. Additionally, earlier this month, congratulations to the work group, a manuscript detailing the recommendations was accepted for publication and can be accessed by uh, at the bit.ly URL on this screen. Another work group is the Coastal Site Priorities Work Group, which was charged with reviewing information on where dry scenids are impacting Great Lakes resources, evaluating site based on the information and other criteria, and developing and implementing a system for prioritizing sites for potential management activities. In December 2022, so about six months ago, the work group announced the release of an interactive dashboard and map that you can see on the screen that displays nearshore data from the Coastal Site Priorities Index. The tool call, is called the Great Lakes uh, Experimental Muscle Suppression site screening tool, or GLEMSC, which is a little bit easier to say. 
and it features a dashboard and associated indices, which are intended to inform future applied dry scene management and research activities by aiding with site prioritization. The tool can be accessed by the bit.ly URL on the screen. Now, finally, I do want to uh, highlight the work of our newest work group, the Planning and Implementation Work Group, which is charged with developing a research and management roadmap for site and regional scale muscle control tools identifying stakeholder and funding priorities and remaining knowledge gap, um, knowledge gaps to guide future dry scenic control activities, and finally to guide and provide input on the development of pr proposed projects involving dry seeded muscle control activities. This work group is building on the products and outcomes of the other three work groups to develop a research and management roadmap for site level dry seeded muscle control. So be on the lookout for more exciting progress over the next year. Today's webinar is part of the Invasive Muscle Communication Network facilitated by the Collaborative. The purpose of these webinars is to facilitate learning and information sharing on topics of common interest within the invasive muscle community. The webinar will be recorded and archived along with past webinars on our website. So if you'd like to learn more about the collaborative or um, are interested in staying in touch with our communication network, we encourage you to visit our website and join our listserv. While we always strive to minimize technological issues during these webinars, I apologize in advance if any should arrive. But before we get to our presenters, I just want to spend a moment to cover a quick um, some logistical items. So audio for this webinar is gonna be streamed through computer speakers unless you choose the call-in option. And you can do that. You can find that from the uh, connection information that was sent out in the registration information email. In order to minimize the potential for interruptions and background noise, we've automatically muted um, attendees and attendees will remain muted with webcams disabled throughout the webinar. We do encourage and accept written questions from attendees during the webinar. So at any time, if you have a question, we want you to go ahead and type it in to the chat box signified by the bubble icon um, on your webinar screen. Questions can be submitted anytime, but we're going to uh, get to all questions after both presentations. We'll have a facilitating Q&A. And then if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can send a message directly through the chat box to James Polidori, or you can um, send us an email at uh, muscles at glc.org. Okay, so enough housekeeping. We can um, get on to our featured presentation. So it's my great pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Alexander Kratia. Dr. Alexander Katia is the, the director of the Great Lakes Center and professor of biology at SUNY Buffalo State College. He received his undergraduate PhD and doctor of science degrees in aquatic biology from uh, Belarusian State University. His research interests include, include ecology, biology, patterns of spread of exotic species and their role in aquatic ecosystems, and biodiversity conservation and management of freshwater ecosystems. He has published over 150 papers and made over 160 presentations at scientific meetings. His research has been funded by numerous federal and state agencies, including the US EPA, Fish and Wildlife Service, and National Geographic Society. Uh, Dr. Kratayev's co-author in this work is uh, Dr. Lubia Berlikova, Dr. Berlikova is a senior research scientist at the Great Lakes Center at Buffalo State College in New York, and um, she's been there since September 2007. Uh, she received her undergraduate degrees in biophysics and PhD in aquatic biology from Belarusian State University. Her research interests and areas of expertise include ecology, biology, patterns of spread of aquatic invasive species and their role in freshwater ecosystems, and ecology, diversity, and conservation of benthic communities. Her research has been also funded um, by a, a variety of state and federal agencies, including US EPA and Fish and Wildlife Service. 
Uh, she has published 128 peer reviewed papers and made over 110 presentations at scientific meetings. We have with us today lots of experience and expertise, and we are so happy to have you join us today. So thanks so much, and I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much for this introduction. In this audience, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, talking about, in general, for uh, zebra muscle or Dracaena polymorpha and uh, quagga muscle Dracaena restriformis bugensis. Just want to mention that they represent novel ecological type in fresh water, and they have features typical for marine muscles like oysters or metallurgy but they also consider the most aggressive freshwater invaders in the Northern Hemisphere. Their life history allowed them to spread rapidly across landscape and became enormously abundant when introduced into a new water world. Also being powerful ecosystem engineers, they deeply modify freshwater ecosystem. However, although they belong to the same genus, they are not identical. They have different tolerance to environmental factors, different rate of spread across landscape, different distribution within water body, different invasion dynamics, and different ecological impact. So zebra mussels start spreading beyond their native range in Europe more than 200 years ago at the beginning of the 19th century. And by the time they reached North America, over 2,000 papers on their biology, ecology, spread, and control were already published in Europe. In contrast, very little was known about its congener, the quagga mussel, before they invaded North America. Less than 8% of all papers published in Europe on dressings in general were focused on the quagga mussel. There was not a single paper talking about long-term population dynamics of quagga mussel. So when they introduced to America and happened actually at the same time, there are even ideas that they came on the same boat. Uh, and since that time, by 2022, zebra mussel had colonized much more states and water bodies. They spread much faster than wagon mussel. Now there are uh, 1,230 lakes and reservoirs colonized by zebra mussel and only 71 by quagga mussel. And I'm talking about lakes and reservoirs excluding rivers. So uh, over 30 years of research conducted on Great Lakes revealed novel patterns of population dynamics and ecological impacts of quagga mussel and these data were not known from European, previous European experience. It was found that lake morphometry governs population dynamics, distribution, and ecological impact of both the species, but the data on quagga mussel were especially intriguing. And these data were recently summarized in a paper published in Hydrobiologia. What uh, Dracaena in Great Lakes uh, are extremely important to study because these are the only large freshwater ecosystem in the world that have combination of these four items. They have large environmental gradients from shallow to deep, from eutrophic to oligotrophic. They all being colonized by both Dracaena species. What is also very important, we have long-term data on Dracaena population dynamics and very good pre-invasion data. And also since 1990s, Dracaena became one of the major or maybe the major driver in Great Lakes ecosystem. So if we want to uh, predict Dracaena ecosystem epoch, we need to know about this population size, population dynamic distribution within water board. So we need to know where they are, how many of them are there, and what's going on with the population, is it increasing or decreasing? In this recent paper, Lake Morphometry Determined Racine of Invasion Dynamics, we analyzed all available lake-wide data on the distribution density and biomass of Dracaena in the Great Lakes from 1990 to 2000, 
to 2020 and apply a statistical and mechanistic biophysical model to address the following question. How different are there seen this population dynamics across deep and shallow lakes and embayments? Which muscle species will win in the competition and will the outcome depend on lake morphometry? And how do these processes affect the ecosystem input? So we had two sets of data, shallow lakes on embayments, Lake St. Clair, Saginaw Bay, Lake Erie Western Basin, where dressing its have access to the whole water column during vegetation season. They exhibit in these lakes high growth rate, short longevity, and high production. And we also have a set of deep lakes in Tierra, Michigan, Huron, where most of the bottom is isolated from warm productive surface water for much of the growing season and recently exhibit slow growth, high longevity, and low production. For the purpose of this paper or, or, or this presentation, we accepted that zebra mussel were found for the first time or reported for the first reported for the first time in Great Lakes in 1988, although later Jim Carton found that there are they probably been to a years earlier, but anyway, uh, you can see that for Quagga, a zebra mussel in two years colonized all Great Lakes except Lake Superior, where they never form a large population. For Quagga mussel, it took four times longer to spread across all Great Lakes. But what's important to remember is that originally all lakes were colonized and dominated by zebra mussel, and only later by Quagga mussel. Uh, lake morphometry determined the distribution of both species. In shallow basin and in payment, both species colonize the whole bottom and form more or less similar population density. Waga mussel became dominant after 8 to 12 years of coexistence, but zebra mussel still present in this lake, and sometimes we even observe the reverse process. For example, in nine, 2019, Western Basin was again dominated by zebra mussel. In contrast, in deep Great Lake, like Michigan, Huron, Ontario, the bulk of zebra mussel population was always limited to the near shore environment, and they formed so called donuts, especially evident in Lake Michigan, for example, in 2000. But in contrast to zebra, quagga mussel colonized. The whole bottom form much higher density and have much stronger ecosystem impact compared to zebra mussel. Lake morphometer also governed uh, the population dynamic, the invasion dynamic. The Racina population dynamics depend on lake, year, and depth in all lakes, but biomass distribution across depth change substantially through time only in deep lakes. The Racina lake-wide biomass peaked at least 15 years in deep lakes, and basically in most of them, the biomass is still growing. So if we look at population dynamic um, across different depth zones, we can see that in all three deep lakes, in less than 30 meters in near shore environment, mussels overshoot their carrying capacity and begin to decline 13, 15 years after first detection. However, after 20 years, there was another increase in density suggesting boom and bust and bus dynamics. At 30 to 90 meters, density increase more slowly, peak later, and decline to a lesser extent. And in deeper zone, density is still growing. Um, in Lake Ontario and Michigan, it looks like the population density stabilized. However, in contrast to density, quagga mussel biomass is still growing across almost all depth zones across the shallowest one, as well as lake wide which tells us that mussels became larger or older. A few years ago, we did experiments on the growth rate where we kept mussels at different 
steps from um, starting on the bottom and then on the um, line and gauges uh, at different uh, water horizon. And we found that muscle growth was slowest in cages located directly on the, at the bottom, less than one millimeter per growing season compared to almost eight millimeters. And this muscle had initial roughly seven millimeters in length. So 25 meters above the bottom was a cutoff for recruitment. And we're talking about East Invasion of Great Lake, of, of Lake Erie. All part of the mooring system above 25 meters completely covered with one young of the year muscles and none of the freshly settled muscles were found deeper than 25 meters. If we look at size frequency distribution uh, from this side, we have data actually for more than 15 years, they not all on this graph, but plaga muscle now we think at least 20 years old or maybe older. They have very fragile shell, no recruitment, and we think that it is starvation. Even if we can record some freshly settled tiny muscles, they never make to the, a new year, the next year. Before uh, Dracaena invasion, the total wet biomass, aerial biomass of plankton in vertebrates in Great Lakes exceeded benthic biomass on average almost sixfold. After the proliferation of waga muscle, benthic wet biomass increased about two orders of magnitude and is currently exceeded zooplankton biomass more than 44. And here I'm talking about uh, waga muscle biomass, including shells and tissue. So now the total bi the biomass in three deep lakes of waga muscle exceeds 95% of all biomass of all animal, aerial biomass of zooplankton, bandas, and fish in Great Lakes. What is also important to realize that in deep lakes, ecological impact gradually shift offshore through the invasion. Early in the invasion, lakes were colonized by the Racina polymorpha alone, and they were limited largely to less than 30 meters. Bentic and pelagic communities were strongly affected by zebra mussel, but the impact was largely limited to base and near shore areas, like in Saginaw Bay, for example. Near shore dracinids and associated benthic organisms retain phosphor and carbon at the expense of offshore communities. And this is near shore phosphorus hypothesis shunt, was formulated by both Peggy and Dorser. But effect on profundal and epilimnetic community was removed. Uh, there was a well recorded decline in diaphragm in profundal zone before these areas were colonized with Brisbane. Later in to mid 2010, the replacement of zebra with waga muscle was associated with dramatic increase of biomass and the shift of the bulk of Dracaena biomass to. 30 to 50 meters. And this is when Hank Van der Ploek estimated the Dracaena clearance rate per day in Michigan and this depth see phytoplankton growth and suggested a mid depth carbon and phosphorus and hypothesis. The explosion of quagga muscle led to increase in psychic depths in both, in, in actually all legs, but in this graph, you can see like Michigan and Huron. And in addition to it just um, a very good indicator of the system making. There were, were lots of other changes like decrease in cystone, chlorophyll, uh, increase in silica, and so on and so on. Although it was suggested that further expansion of cargo muscle will be restricted by low phytoplankton productivity, recently the bulk of quagga muscle has shifted to much deeper areas. Um, usually the, now in all three legs, maximum depths around 70 to 90 meters. The shift was associated with a large decline in dressing density and biomass in the near shore zone and strong increase in depth in deep zone and lake wide biomass. We hypothesize that the shift of muscle population will likely continue to even deeper areas, going for further 
investigation to understand the ecosystem impact of the shift and suggest in you of short carbon and phosphorescent hypothesis. And you can see with this increase, uh, or with this shift of population deeper, we have further increase in psychedelics. So this movement of the bulk of muscle deeper has lots of ecosystem consequences. Okay? In shallow warm environment, waga muscle with longevity, say three to four years, an average will be more important player in food webs than in deep modified uh, certified areas where they likely live for more than 30 years. In contrast, in deep areas, muscle will likely accumulate phosphorus in their tissues for much longer than in the near shore environment. And this is a typical uh, distribution or density of quagga muscle in the uh, current maximum, it's 80 meters there at Lake Michigan. This is the zone of maximum distribution of quagga muscle now in all three great lakes. So <clears throat> the effect of psychedists increase in all lakes except Lake Superior, where again there is no sizable population. Quagga muscle decline in chlorophyll now for only small ligotrophic and superior, for example, decline in phytoplankton, decline in uh, zooplankton, also in all lakes colonized, in all Great Lakes colonized ways. Uh, Quagga mussel will have strong in decline in diapari, but there is also increase in uh, oligarchies and sometimes will have increase in Pyronomics. Very strong impact on phosphorus, significant decline in total phosphorus concentration across uh, all Great Lakes was associated with a recent need activity resulted in oligotrophication of deep Great Lakes, or sometimes people call it bentification. In the very influential paper published in Proceeding of Natural Academy of, in Proceeding of Natural Academy of Science by Leon Torsen, they estimated that the quagga muscle in now, is now the primary regulator of phosphorus cycling in the lower four Great Lakes, representing a dramatic example of large-scale reorganization of a gay chemical cycle by a single in Waiter by a single species. And again, I want to remind you that the biomass of the single species of quagga mussel now exceeds 95% of all animal biomass in Great Lakes. So the impact of fish is quite controversial. In the native areas, more than 90% of production of is consumed by fishes. So they play extremely important and valuable role in food chain dynamics, in, for example, in Caspian. In an invaded area, it depends mostly on the feeding mode of the fish. Pentivorous fish usually benefits even those that do not feed on dressinids, as at least 58 species of pentivorous fishes on both continents feed on adult dressinids and 17 species on their larvae. Plantivorous fish can be negatively affected as a result of lower phytoplankton abundance and associated decrease in zooplankton and increased visibility. However, in Great Lakes, quagga mussel caused a decline in abundance of commercially important white fish through the dramatic, dramatic decrease in diaper eye. This outcome cannot be predicted from European experience as Dracaena introduction was always associated with increase in amphipore. But again, most of the European experience is based on the impact of zebra mussel rather than on quagga mussel. Shift on white fish to quagga mussel resulted in the decline of body conditions, growth, and abundance. In contrast, in Europe, in recently colonized lakes, again mostly by zebra mussel, the diet approach, the switch to zebra mussel resulted in faster growth and higher lipid content. The introduction of round gobi added a very important link between dressy needs and uh, commercially and recreationally valuable fish species. 
global fish and dressing needs and in turn is actively consumed by fish increase then the passage of energy accumulated by dressing is back to pelagic environment. In this video that uh, was taken by USAPA, you can see uh, this like uh, video vice by lowering on the bottom crash to shelf and gobies and this fish. Uh, we recently conducted study on the uh, native sturgeon diet in Loa. Niagara River, and we found that 90% of sturgeon die biomass wise based on feeding on gobies. Uh, and gobies, in turn, <clears throat> quite often fed on wagon and zebra. So, uh, and now I would like to say a few words what we don't know. Wagon muscle population explosion early in the invasion was well documented, but there is lack of long-term data to predict what environmental factors will determine if later in the invasion the population was, will fluctuate widely, will be relatively stable or decline. As we can see in shallow lakes, population usually reach their maximum around 14, 15 years roughly after the invasion. In deep lakes, biomass is still going with no idea of what uh, they will reach carrying or exceed carrying capacity and start decline. We need more data on fecundity duration of the planktonic stage, time to sexual immaturity, and longevity of quagga muscle in shallow, but especially in deep stratified water. More work needed to determine the spawning cues of deep water quagga muscle. In deep water, Hemorrhage is always below seven degrees C. What environmental factors target the beginning of this morning? What they uh, use as a food? And uh, what are this growth rate? Because it looks like that they can live much, much, much longer by an order of magnitude longer than the shallow environment. pH and calcium are among the most important environmental variables limiting the spread of zebra and also likely quagga muscle. While data on zebra muscles are numerous, we don't have similar data on quagga muscle. Most studies on the effect of quagga muscles on the flow of energy throughout food web in different continents and water body types are needed to fully understand and predict the impact on the recipient fish community and nutrient cycle. And again, in the recently published paper, what we know and what we don't, we summarize all experience, European and North American on these two species and also focus on the lacking information. Uh, with, with this, I would like to acknowledge our funding energy agency, US EPA and everybody who helped us in this research. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, it's really wonderful. We're going to move right along to our next presentation. However, any questions from our first presentation can be entered directly into the chat box and will be answered during our facilitated Q&A. So our next presenters are Krista Gantz and Rich Miller. Krista Gantz is a PhD candidate in the Department of Science and Management at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. She is interested in how anthropogenic stressors impact freshwater animal populations at both lake and regional wide scales. The work presented today was part of two graduate research assistantships from grants that are focused on early detection of dry seeded mussels in the Pacific Northwest. Rich Miller is an aquatic biologist with the uh, Environmental Science Associates. Prior to his work with ESA, Rich was a research technician at the Center for Lakes and Reservoirs at Portland State University, uh, specializing in water quality assessment and aquatic invasive plant and animal surveys. Thanks so much for sharing your work with us today. And Rich, whenever you're ready, go ahead and share your screen. Great, um, thanks for having us. Um, so it was a very, very interesting um, presentation. So Krista and I are going to talk about some work that we did at a, a reservoir in uh, California years ago. And um, our co-authors on this are Steve Wells, who's with the uh, um, 
uh, Aquaticus and used to be at uh, Portland State University and Dr. Mark Sitzma and Angela Strecker. Mark Sitzma used to be at um, Portland State and Angela is currently at Western Washington University and also used to be at Portland State. Um, funding for this project uh, was mainly provided by Bonneville Power Administration through a technical innovation grant and also through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service through um, uh, their Oregon uh, Aquatic Nuisance, Nuisance Species Plan and also Western Washington University. So um, in contrast to the, the, the work that's been um, presented already, um, we're going to talk about a uh, reservoir in, in the Western United States, and they're uh, quite distinct from the Great Lakes. Um, one of the reasons is because they're very dynamic in water levels. Um, uh, some of them are very, very productive. Um, uh, annual fluctuation can be huge. This particular reservoir in this picture here is uh, San Luis Reservoir. It's the largest off-channel reservoir um, in the United States. Um, it can draw down 100 to 150, even 200 feet um, each year and then uh, uh, refill, um, mainly used for uh, irrigation water throughout California. And water has moved all through California through these, the system, and, which is part of the um, California Water Project. Um, so this is really important for um, the, the life cycle and habitat conditions for um, zebra and quagga mussels, but we're gonna be talking about zebra mussels in particular. So um, I'm gonna give a little bit of background of uh, uh, the phenology and the habitat suitability of these uh, reservoirs. And then Chris is gonna talk about some of the results from the work that we did. Um, so just a little background for uh, and zebra mussel phenology. Um, they spawning generally begins about 12, to 12 degrees Celsius. Uh, villagers emerge for three to five days and um, they stay in this planktonic form for up to a month. Um, and then they can, uh, uh, they settle on the bottom and then they're in the adult stage for up to nine years. And they can survive up to, to 30 degrees um, Celsius. In the, in the planktonic stage, there's uh, various um, uh, stages, um, straight hinge, early umbonal, umbonal, and late umbonal, the petty villager um, that we're gonna talk about later in the, in the presentation. So um, how the habitat suitability changes in, in particular with these uh, Western water bodies, um, uh, dissolved oxygen is really important. Like I mentioned before, uh, the, some of these reservoirs are really productive and the hypolimnetic oxygen gets depleted down below um, two milligrams per liter, which is, which is kind of a threshold for uh, 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 sunlight recruitment. Um, and it, a lot of them, it goes anoxic and stays anoxic for quite a while. So this can limit where um, zebra and quagga mussels can survive. Um, in the shallower water with these uh, reservoirs that really draw down and fill back up, um, you get desiccation and uh, uh, Z, they can survive for three to five days um, out of the water, but um, much longer than that, you're, you're killing uh, mussels. So um, this term mussel squeeze that we're using, it's basically the reduction of suitable habitat due to the timing of hypolimatic oxygen depletion and reservoir operations. So um, can operations be changed to minimize the suitable habitat for uh, zebra mussels? So overall, our big study questions are, uh, how does villager abundance change over time and across depth? How does temperature and oxygen change across depth and with changing water levels? What's the relationship between villager abundance and temperature, and how does temperature and uh, dissolved oxygen affect adult mortality? And then again, can we use re reservoir operation and the timing of, of this, how it interacts with the, the st life stage um, of zebra mussels to maximize this muscle squeeze? So we did our work at uh, a reservoir just um, 
downstream of the reservoir that I showed the picture of. This is San Justo Reservoir. It's a uh, terminal reservoir um, on the, the California Water Project, and that, which means that it's an off-channel reservoir and water gets pumped into it and um, out of it. And the water that goes out of it goes to irrigate the San Luis Valley. Um, a lot of the, the vegetables that you all eat, um, it, uh, zebra mussels were detected in 2008, and the lake was closed to public access, which was um, quite a bummer for all the folks that used to fish and recreate on the, the water body, and it's remained closed. Um, it's 81 hectares. Um, again, it's got this combined inflow outflow pipe. Um, and water levels depend on irrigation supply and demand. So each day, water comes into the reservoir and out of the reservoir just a little bit. But over the season, water levels drop. Um, and it's uh, 30 meters deep when full. And it's a, a mesotrophic uh, to eutrophic water body. And um, the, the hypolimnetic hypolimnion goes anoxic um, each year. So um, with the study, we um, collected uh, villager samples. Um, did it on eight dates between uh, January 2015 and August 2015. We collected them from two sites at one meter depth intervals from the surface to the bottom. Um, we did this by using a peristaltic pump, pumping it through a five, uh, five liters through a, a 65 micron mesh cup, and then um, concentrating that down into a, a sample bottle. And then Steve Wells and crew at Portland State University enumerated um, all the, the, the villagers to these different stages using cross-polarized light microscopy. Um, the adult muscle measurements, um, we uh, uh, collected uh, muscles from around the reservoir um, and randomly selected 10 muscles um, from each, each of a mesh bag and placed them on to 90 subsurface buoys the muscles range from five to 30 millimeters in each bag. And we, it's kind of a random stratified um, sample. So we tried to have uh, span the, the, the same range um, within each of the, the different bags. And we uh, deployed the bags from zero to 25 meter deep. And um, we measured the, whether the, the um, muscles were live or dead and also the, the muscle length during each of the sampling events. And this picture on here in the, the left, that shows the inlet outlet pipe on the right hand side. Um, we had a, a, a villager measure, monitoring site um, right where the inlet outlet pipe comes in. We have the, uh, another site at the deepest location of the water body where we uh, measured um, villagers. And then all these kind of gray dots that you can see scattered in through here, th these are where we place these uh, um, subsurface buoys. Um, there's, there's a lot of information that we collected on this, but we're not gonna be talking about this. Um, most of it other than the, than the muscle cage data, which you can see in the, the third picture over, um, basically a mesh bag um, tied on that we, we check. And we also uh, collected water quality measurements, again, at this inlet outlet site and then the deep site. And we measured temperature, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and conductivity with the YSI meter at one meter depth increments. And we also, um, so we were really concerned about whether this inlet outlet pipe was pumping oxygen into the lake. So we, you know, maybe you'd have a little bit longer survival um, in that area. Um, based on extra oxygen. So we put uh, uh, continuous temperature loggers at the bottom of that site and then also the deep site. And I'll turn it over to Krista here to, to talk about um, a little bit more about the, the study analysis and objectives. Great. Thanks, Rich. Um, yeah, Rich and I are in different parts of Washington State, so we're <laughs> doing a split split presentation here. So I'll go ahead and share. 
as Samantha said in the introduction, um, this was work that I did through um, two different graduate research assistantships. And this was a really neat project to work on. And um, one of the great things um, about working on it and getting started with it is there were really clear, um, well, in addition to the fact that Rich and Steve did all of the field work, <laughs> um, they also had really clear um, objectives for the different studies. And this made um, learning about um, the project and the reservoir and mussels um, much more pleasant and also uh, made the analyses um, easier to organize and kind of think through, um, I hope, at least for us as a group. So um, the way I've kind of uh, organized my part of the talk and think about it is by the two different surveys. So looking at both villagers and adults, and um, this is helpful kind of to think about, um, you know, different aspects of monitoring and control. Um, and then also, especially for the adults thinking really about um, optimal times for a drawdown uh, to deprive these uh, muscles of oxygen. So with the villagers, uh, the objectives were to determine the timing and distribution of the spawning. And we were really hoping to learn more about this from the presence of early stage villagers or the, um, the straight hinge phase that Rich showed. And then we also wanted to determine the timing of settlement out of the water column. So particularly to see when we would start seeing pedivillagers and, and being close to that phase of adulthood. And then uh, finally, we wanted to relate uh, temperature and DO or to see if there were any patterns of temperature and DO um, with vertical distribution in the water column. And then with the adults, we wanted to measure uh, adult, me uh, excuse me, adult muscle survivorship at different water depths and across time. And then to also see if there were any relationships between temperature and DO um, with adult survival. Oops, I'm in a little bit of trouble with my advancement there. Okay. So I just wanted to walk through um, our temperature and DO profiles first. And these are from the deep station that Rich pointed out on the map. So if you kind of um, orient your eyes from left to right, uh, you'll see our sampling dates uh, from January to August. And you can see that um, with, with this reservoir and a lot of um, reservoirs in the West, uh, we don't really have freezing temperatures, so we have uh, much warmer temperatures in um, late uh, January and February in California. And then you can start to see um, the stratification starting um, in, um, in early April. And then um, from April through August, uh, you really have um, temperatures for optimal spawning um, within 17 to 18 degrees. But if the muscles are spawning earlier, um, you could potentially have spawning um, earlier or you could have it um, in the fall. And we didn't um, survey in the fall, but um, I can talk about that um, in subsequent slides. And then with the dissolved oxygen profiles, if you kind of look from right to left, You'll see that um, you know in January and February we had pretty high DO, and then we start to um, get lower DO um, from uh, April through August, and then you're starting to hit that lower physiological limit for the muscles um, at uh, two milligrams per liter or less um, of DO. So the results, um, I, I wanted to go through the Belliger results first. And this we also refer to in our paper, which is in uh, Management of Biological Invasions. Uh, we refer to this as a pumped plankton experiment. Um, and so I wanted to go through um, the three Velliger stages, straight hinge, um, embonal, and uh, pedivelliger. Um, but I'll kind of just walk through this in a little bit more detail. And also in our paper, we had done some generalized linear mixed models 
uh, for both the pumped plankton and the adult survivorship. And I won't go through those models here, but there are more details of that in our paper as well. So if you kind of look across the two rows, we're going in chronological order. And uh, we've indicated the thermocline with the green line, the hypoxic depth, uh, so less than two, milligr two milligrams per liter of DO, but uh, more than 0 0.1 milligram with the yellow. And then below, um, the red line is below 0 0.1 milligram per liter DO. Um, so what we're seeing here is, um, you, you can really see an increase in density um, starting in the summer. So starting at, in the bottom row uh, between the June and August sampling events. And then you're seeing um, kind of a clustering a few meters um, above the thermocline. And then we're seeing a pretty clear um, hypolimnion where we're not seeing very many, we're, zero to very few muscles um, below that um, anoxic depth. So this is um, really helpful in kind of determining um, where you'd want the depths you'd really want to focus on for, um, for monitoring and where they really like to live when they first are spawning. And so with the umbonal stage, um, we're seeing very similar patterns uh, with, uh, with the plankton, um, slightly less uh, in the June sampling months um, and August, but a little bit more in July. So this is concurrent with the straight hinge. And then with Peta villager, we didn't really see a lot um, of individuals compared to straight hinge and umbonal, but we are seeing a clear pattern where they're settling out of the water column. So to give a little bit of background for the adult mussels, um, you saw this uh, buoy setup and the map uh, that Rich presented. So just to give a little bit of, um, of a refresher on this again. And um, we did have uh, with this setup, uh, these settling plates and we have data on this and we didn't write it up yet, but we have some kind of um, potentially interesting future work to do with these. And these are the results for our um, muscle bag experiment. And so kind of looking again from left to right, you can see chronologically um, our, our sampling. And we have, uh, this is the survival percentage of surveyed adult muscles across all the sampling events. So one thing that really um, popped out at us is that we had um, higher than expected uh, survivorship uh, at low DO. So um, between uh, April 11th and May 6th, uh, we had a, a really large and unexpected proportion of individuals that um, survived at uh, really low DO. And then once we get into June through August, um, I guess we were expecting less of a proportion of um, individuals to survive, but the fact that we saw some sporadic um, survival in uh, the June 2nd and June 24th uh, sampling events was um, pretty surprising. So as Rich had mentioned, um, we had two uh, um, mini dot samplers at each of the sampling stations, the deep and the in out station. And um, we were wondering if perhaps we had some, um, some oxygenated water coming in through the water operations at either the in out or the deep station. Um, and so what we're seeing here is um, with the deep station and, and also um, the inlet outlet, um, very few um, significant uh, fluctuations in DO and really low DO um, starting in about April. So this, um, made us feel better about what we were seeing um, with the results for the muscle bags. Just, um, just really a pretty long period of time uh, at low oxygen with um, pretty high survival. So um, this, I just wanted to quickly go through um, 
our model results, our generalized linear mixed model results for the muscle bags. And um, what we looked at, and there are more details about this in our publication, but we looked at temperature, um, a couple of different DO variables, lengths, and then we had buoy and event as random effects. And one thing that was um, pretty interesting was that uh, length came out as significant. So we were finding that um, individuals, um, I can't remember Rich's range of size of individuals, but larger um, individuals as, me as measured by length were coming out as having a higher survival rate um, at the end um, of the um, measurement cycle um, than smaller individuals. So just to give a couple of highlights um, of results and discussion for each uh, survey, um, there were fluctuations in uh, depth distribution of the plankton. So um, this is an important consideration for monitoring uh, planktonic villagers, especially when they're at their peak. So we want to get in there and, and uh, start control when we have the most individuals um, in the water column. And um, villager sampling in these stratified water bodies uh, should be focused in the epilimnion um, when there are depleted DO conditions below the thermocline, which we saw um, in those um, uh, spring and summer sampling months. Um, and it looks like villager settlement out of the water column is possible when uh, any villager stage is present, at least in the spring, summer, and winter. And we didn't sample in the fall, but it's possible given these temperatures that another fall spawning event could be possible, um, especially uh, because they're over the uh, uh, temperatures are over the optimum um, limit for spawning. And then for the adult survey, um, we found that the adult muscles are susceptible to low DO, but um, really would need to be deprived of oxygen for uh, greater than three weeks to achieve high levels of mortality. And we found a positive relationship between initial adult length and survivorship. So this kind of highlights the importance of um, capturing villagers before adulthood and catch, capturing small individuals if possible before they get uh, much larger. So uh, our overall conclusions are that uh, for management purposes, uh, you'd want to find an opportune time for drawdown or chemical control uh, to target the optimal number of individuals. And we, we kind of thought in this study that might be about 15 to 16 degrees Celsius when you might want to start looking um, in the uh, water for, for uh, plankton. And then several... Um, we're acknowledging that several factors uh, such as water use or other logistic concerns may be a factor in decision-making for particular reservoirs. Um, people still need this water, so um, you can't always get in there and, um, and practice control uh, uh, anytime you want to. Um, so if control is not plausible at optimal spawning or survivorship peaks, um, these factors could identify water depths and locations to focus collection efforts and control. Um, and so if there's more monitoring, um, there's a need for a, a better understanding of how villagers, juveniles, and adult muscles uh, respond to fluctuating DO conditions and how that will inform the timing and duration of control. Um, so with that, um, I'll conclude. And then uh, as we go into the question and answer session, if anybody has any further questions for me or Rich, we can be reached at these um, email addresses. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. We already have some questions coming in. So I will um, go ahead and ask them out in order. Go ahead and use the chat feature to ask questions. And if you need to jump off before your question is answered, um, a recording will be available on the Invasive Muscle Collaborative website um, with, and our YouTube channel. And the recording will include the facilitating Q&A. So we can jump right in. Okay, so this first question is, is for Rich and 
Krista. Um, San Justo is the only reservoir in California with zebra mussels. The others have quagga. Any thoughts on how these results may relate to quagga mussels? I can take that, uh, Krista, and add on if you want. But um, but it uh, since they have different ph physiological um, uh, requirements, like Alexander mentioned, it it it's probably similar, um, but there could be little little tiny differences. Like in particular, the the we were really surprised at the three week or so um, delay between anoxic conditions and death. Um, that um, we may be surprised that the the um, uh, the quagga mussels may so not survive as long or may survive longer. Um, so it could be little things like that, but I, I would think that the results would be fairly similar. Uh, there was mention of lake sturgeon diets in relation to round goby and zebra mussels in the first presentation. Is there a reference to where this data is coming from? Uh, you are talking about uh, round goby, uh, uh, lake sturgeon feeding on round goby? I believe so, yes. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, there is a paper published by Eric Brustel, and there is a we mentioned this paper in our review of what uh, what we have learned and said years of innovation in Great Lakes. So um, it could be found there. Great. And we will include the DOI links to each of the papers um, along with the recording link when we uh, send out our follow-up email to everyone who registered. So you, you can have access to, to the papers and the recording. Okay, Rich and Krista, have the results um, been published? Articles or dissertation or have you, do you have any plans to publish? This was a really interesting study. I think uh, I know the answer to this one, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that um, that question and comment. So yeah, we have a, um, I think we're still impressed. We have this work published under this title in management of um, biological invasions. And I will again, send out a, a DOI link to that as a- as Oh, great, well. thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, and back to our first presenter. Are there any theories as why quagga mussels haven't gained ground in Lake Superior? What's holding them back? Well, it, because of uh, Lake Superior water chemistry is not uh, really favorable for zebra or quagga mussel. They still, they present as species, but limited to very um, to areas near the river mouths and uh, ports. So in our lake-wide surveys for many years, we found only one tiny individual broken. So we couldn't even determine if it was zebra or quagma. So basically there is no population because of the, the water chemistry is not good for them. And can you elaborate a little bit what specifically about the water chemistry is, makes uh, Lake Superior? Well, uh, zebra mussel usually re and and, uh, and possibly quagga mussel required calcium about 20 milligram per liter, and in Lake Superior it's much lower. Great. Okay, back to the Portland group. Do you see um, a gradient in villager concentration from the shore to deep water areas? Um, so we, um, it's a pretty small reservoir that we're at. Um, so we've just focused in on the two two locations and we didn't see much variation between the, the two locations. Um, uh, Steve might have taken C. Wells, who's also a co-author, he might have taken some uh, villager toes at different spots, but I, I don't remember there being any huge difference. And then uh, following up from that question, is the reservoir a drinking water supply? And can you um, answer, is it a ligotrophic, mesiotrophic, or, or eutrophic? Um, the, the reservoir is primarily used for irrigation. Um, uh, the, the, towards the town of Salinas, there's a large irrigate, uh, 
farmland area. So this uh, is used to irrigate that whole area. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a mesotrophic to eutrophic reservoir. Um, can't remember off the top of my head what the, what the chlorophyll levels were, but it's, it's um, basically meso to uh, eutrophic and um, uh, calcium levels, in case anybody's wondering, calcium levels are, um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head again, what they were, but they're sufficient for um, growth of, of zebra mussels. It's over 20 milligrams per liter. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. If you have any other questions, please enter them into the chat so we can we can ask our speakers while we have them on the line. Okay, well, we'll go back to you, uh, Dr. Kariv. Uh, are quagga mussels as easily transported via canals and rivers as zebra mussels? It depends. If you're talking downstream transport on the larval stage, yes. If you're talking a cage to boat, no, because of Zebra mussel has much stronger attachment strength than quagga mussel. Therefore, we have much more lakes and reservoirs, uh, 17 times more in United States, in North America, uh, because of they attach much stronger and could uh, survive uh, transport on the attach time. Okay. But if you're talking about downstream spread in a larger stage, of course, the same situation. Okay, I do have one question for you. Um, can can you you gave us a really great overview of the past thirty five years? Can you talk a little bit more about? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic about the next thirty five years within the Great Lakes? <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball, of course, but um, it, it depends what's optimistic, what's pessimistic. I think that uh, both the recent species will be present in Great Lakes forever. And they provide important ecosystem services, as well as they provide some serious problems. Um, I don't think they will, the population will keep growing uh, for many years in deep lakes. I think we're about to see the stabilization and, and possible decline, but again, Great Lakes, the only ecosystem when in the world when we have this long-term data. We don't have any anything similar in Europe or anywhere in North America that we can look and say, okay, this is what we can predict. In contrast, now zebra mussel colon and quag, especially quagga mussel colonizing deep alpine lakes, and they're using our experience to predict what happened with uh, Day lakes in Switzerland, for example. This June, Lube and I will be going to Switzerland, to Zurich, to basically share with them our data. So that, that's why it's extremely important to continue monitoring uh, where, what's going on in Great Lakes. Couldn't agree more, absolutely. Um, have you seen any impacts on water quality from the loss of zooplankton in the Great Lakes? Uh, there is a decline in zooplankton, but uh, lakes became clearer, and this is a, in a way, a positive effect. Yes, the whole uh, binational treaty that was signed in 1972 was about largely to decrease phosphorus load to fight eutrophication, and this is what's going on now with uh, quagga mussel. Maybe it's a little bit too far, but that's fine. Okay, I think that concludes all of our questions. So a big thanks again to all of our presenters and thanks to everyone on the line for joining us today. Um, as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and it's going to be posted on the Invasive Muscle Collaborative website. So you should be able to see that later this week. We will send out an email through Eventbrite for everyone registered with um, the recording link, the DOI links to each of the respective papers, and contact information for our speaker should you have any follow-up questions that you want to get in contact with them about. And um, you can also feel free to contact 
the Invasive Muscle Collaborative at muscles at plc.org. Okay, and finally, I just wanted to acknowledge our funding. Um, our funding comes from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative under cooperative agreement through the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, thanks again. Oh, this is wrong. I didn't update this slide, so just ignore that. We'll just switch back to here. Um, thanks so much, and, and go ahead and subscribe to our listserv and uh, our um uh, news of upcoming webinars will be shared there. So thanks so much. And, and thanks again to our speakers.